In the first part of the salivary gland presentation, we discussed about the structural arrangement of the salivary glands and the histological perspective. Moving ahead now, in this presentation, we'll take a look at how saliva is formed. Salivary secretion may be defined as a unidirectional movement of fluid, electrolytes and macromolecules into saliva in response to appropriate stim stimulation. So saliva is formed in two stages. The first stage is the production of the primary secretion by the acinar cells, while in the second stage, which is carried out by the ducts, which are the intercalated and the striated ducts, the primary secretion is modified. The main duct involved in this is the striated duct. We already discussed about the mucus and serous sinai in the previous presentation and the types of secretions they produce. The primary saliva formed and released from acinar cells is isotonic and is modified by duct cells to form the hypotonic solution by the removal and addition of specific ions. So ultimately the saliva that enters the oral cavity is hypotonic. A number of different systems are involved in ionic transport across the basolateral and luminal surfaces of acinar and duct cells. So in the previous presentation, we saw the structure of the acinar cells and the duct cells. So on the basolateral membrane, the sodium potassium ATPase exchanges three sodium ions in an outward direction toward the interstitium with two potassium moving inward. So the result is the maintenance of high, high intracellular potassium and low intracellular sodium. So we already dealt with sodium and potassium. The next is the transport of chloride, which is done by the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. The other ionic transport systems involved are sodium and hydrogen ion and chloride and bicarbonate ion exchangers, which allow the transport of bicarbonate and protons, while chloride and sodium are taken up by the acinar cells. So on the luminal surface, chloride channels allow for the rapid efflux of chloride following cellular stimulation. So all in all, there are four ionic transport systems which are majorly involved in this. The sodium-potassium ATPase exchanger, the sodium-potassium chloride co-transporter, sodium and proton exchanger and chloride and bicarbonate exchanger. So how does this saliva become isotonic? During salivary secretion, there is rapid movement of water following stimulation. Since the cyanar cells shrink dramatically following stimulated secretion, it appears that most of the water moves by osmosis in response to sodium in the primary saliva. There is also evidence for paracellular or transcellular movement of water, and aquaporins are believed to be involved in this process. Aquaporins 1 and 5 are the predominant aquaporins in the human salivary glands, which are localized primarily in serous acini on the apical membranes of acinar cells, including the intercalated canaliculi. Stage 2 of the salivary secretions process is the modification of the primary saliva by the duct system. So, as mentioned in the previous presentation, the striated ducts are mainly responsible for the resorption of sodium and chloride and for the secretion of potassium and bicarbonate. A point to be noted here is that water is not resorbed here. So, this results in hypotonic saliva. So, let's take a closer look at the striated ducts. The basolateral membrane of duct cells possesses high sodium potassium ATPase activity and sodium proton exchanger as well as chloride and potassium channels. And all these exchanges occur in a similar manner as we just saw in relation to the acinar cells. Water resorption does not take place here, which results in the formation of hypotonic saliva. The clinical significance of this stage of formation of saliva is that a genetic mutation in the cystic fibrosis gene, it alters chloride and other channels in saliva gland and it can lead to the array of symptoms which are found in cystic fibrosis. A number of factors control the quality and quantity of saliva secreted. The control of saliva gland secretion is mediated by the autonomic nervous system that is the ANS. All the salivary gland cells receive ENS supply. Control of secretion is also dependent on the perception of taste and smell. And the gustatory stimulus 
especially sour and salty is more important than the masticatory stimulus in controlling the salivary secretion. The secretion of saliva occurs by the process of stimulus secretion coupling which refers to the events involving release of neurotransmitter from vesicles in nerve terminals adjacent to the par parenchymal cells which stimulate them to discharge secretory granules, water and electrolytes as well as contraction of myoepithelial cells. Norepinephrine activates both alpha and beta adrenergic receptors while parasympathetic transmitters like acetylcholine activate cholinergic receptors. Alpha adrenergic receptor stimulation results in protein secretion while beta adrenergic or cholinergic stimulation results in low protein secretion and the secretion of water along with electrolytes. Substance B stimulates alpha adrenergic and cholinergic secretion of saliva. So we will see that in a while. The parotid gland is primarily stimulated and partly the submandibular gland. Hence while eating, serous salivary secretion is stimulated. So, in general, copious watery saliva is secreted in response to parasympathetic stimulation and thicker organic saliva is secreted in response to sympathetic stimulation. The sublingual gland and partly the submandibular gland are responsible for an increase in mucus content of salivary secretion. Effects of parasympathetic stimulation are stronger and long-lasting. The parasympathetic system is typically responsible in normal day-to-day -day function the sympathetic system usually works when our fight or flight response is triggered. Sympathetic fibers arise from the thoracolumbar region of the spinal cord, synapse primarily in the superior cervical ganglion, and travel with blood vessels to reach the salivary glands. The parasympathetic fibers originate in the superior and inferior salivatory nuclei of the brainstem and synapse in a ganglion in close proximity to the glands. In the parotid gland, preganglionic fibers travel with the glossopharyngeal that is the ninth cranial nerve to the utic ganglion and from the ganglion, postganglionic fibers travel with the auriculotemporal nerve to the gland. The parasympathetic innervation of the sublingual and submandibular glands originates in the superior salivatory nucleus. The pathway involves the facial nerve that is the seventh cranial nerve via the corda tympani the preganglionic fibers to the submandibular ganglion and after synapsing the postganglionic fibers innervate the glands via the lingual nerve. The norepinephrine binds to specific adrenal receptors which are the adrenergic receptors on the basolateral surface of the sinus cells and results in elevation of intracellular cyclic AMP. Parasympathetic stimulation primarily regulates fluid secretion through elevation of cytosolic free intracellular calcium. The elevated calcium stimulates AQP that are the aquaporins trafficking to the apical plasma membrane. So aquaporins are a family of small homologous integral membrane proteins which function as highly selective water channels in fluid transporting epithelia. So this consequently leads to rapid water movement. The clinical significance from a pharmacological perspective is such as pilocarpine, which is a parasympathetic cholinergic agent. It stimulates saliva gland secretion and alters the tonicity of the saliva. And atropine is a parasympatholytic drug which inhibits the water parasympathetic mediated secretion of the salivary glands. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves also control blood flow through the salivary glands, which is a major factor in regulation of salivary flow rates. So the parasympathetic nerves produce vasodilation and increase production of saliva, whereas sympathetic fibers are of two types basically. One is vascular, which is primarily vasoconstrictive, and the other one being secretory type sympathetics. The sympathetic nerve influence varies with the pattern of sympathetic activity. Next, moving on to the signal transduction in salivary glands. So salivary glands produce saliva, a watery secretion containing a few specific proteins and the odd digestive enzymes such as salivary amylase. So this secretion occurs in two parts. Proteins are secreted by exocytosis which is under the control of sympathetic nervous system and transduced by noradrenaline and cyclic AMP. Whereas fluid and electrolyte is, is controlled by the parasympathetic nerves using acetylcholine and calcium as first and second messengers respectively. 
The first stage of signal transduction is binding of acetylcholine to a muscarinic, which is a seven membrane spanning domain G protein activating receptor. Binding of the neurotransmitter to the extracellular domain of the receptor causes GTP to bind to the alpha subunit. Now before this GTP replaces GTP now, and this GTP now binds to the alpha subunit of a heterotrimeric G protein associated with the cytoplasmic domain of the membrane. The activated alpha subunit of the G protein dissociates from the beta and gamma subunits and in turn activates a membrane bound enzyme phospholipase C. In the process of activating phospholipase C, the G protein inactivates itself by hydrolyzing the bound GTP. Phospholipase C hydrolyzes phosphoinositol 4,5-bisphosphate that is PIP2 into diacylglycerol that is DAG and inositol 1,4,5-triphosphate that is IP3. Diacylglycerol remains within the plasma membrane and it acts as a second messenger in its own right which causes activation of protein kinase C. IP3 leaves the plasma membrane and moves into the cytoplasm. This IP3 then binds to IP3 receptors on the intracellular calcium stores. So this yes. calcium then leaves the intracellular stores and enters the cytoplasm thus increasing the cytoplasmic calcium. The increase in cytoplasmic calcium concentration gives rise to fluid and electrolyte secretion thus completing the signal transduction pathway the second stage is protein secretion in salivary gland so the first extracellular messenger that initiates protein secretion is noradrenaline which was released by sympathetic neurons the first stage of the signal transduction pathway where noradrenaline binds to its receptor and activates an intracellular G protein is very similar to the first part of acetylcholine IP3 calcium signal transduction pathways which is very similar to the one that we just saw in relation to fluid and electrolyte secretion. The alpha subunit of the G protein activated in this path stimulates adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is a membrane bound enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of ATP to cyclic adenosine 3-5- monophosphate that is CAMP. So CAMP moves from the membrane into the cytoplasm thus passing the signal into the cell. The target for CAMP is a CAMP dependent protein kinase which is usually known as protein kinase A or simply PKA. Protein kinase A phosphorylates and activates a wide variety of target proteins and enzymes which accelerate all the steps of protein synthesis and packaging and also cause exocytosis of completed protein containing vesicles. Now no signal transduction pathway is complete without a mechanism for switching the signal off again. The cyclic AMP second messenger pathway is terminated by the action of an enzyme called phosphodiesterase that breaks down CAMP. Okay, so this was secretion of saliva. Let's discuss few points about saliva as well. Saliva is 99% water and 1% protein and salts. The normal daily production of saliva varies between 0.5 and 1.5 liters. The amount of saliva secreted by the major and minor glands is referred to as whole saliva. In the resting, that is the unstimulated state, approximately two-thirds of the total volume of the whole saliva is produced by submandibular glands. And upon stimulation, the parotid glands are responsible for at least 50% of the total volume of saliva from the mouth. The whole unstimulated saliva flow rate is approximately 0.3 to 0.5 ml per minute, which reduces to 0.1 ml per minute during sleep. And it increases to about 4 to 5 ml per minute during eating, chewing and other stimulating activities. During sleep, very little saliva is secreted by major salivary glands and majority of the saliva is secreted is by the minor salivary glands. So. Saliva is always hypotonic to plasma. As the whole saliva flow rate will increase, the tonicity of the saliva will increase too. An increase in the flow of saliva is referred to as siloria, that is tylism, while a decrease in the salivary flow is referred to as erostomia, that is dry mouth. For this presentation, this is it. We discussed about the formation of saliva and it's um, how it is secreted and few points about saliva. I hope you have liked this presentation. Please do like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.